Excellent. Welcome, everybody. Hello there. Excellent. It looks like we're getting a big crowd coming here. So my name is Joe Vlevsky. I'm a naturalist at Wolf Ridge. And uh, the pictures that you're seeing are just some pictures that I decided to show. They're, they're pictures I've taken in March. Can you believe it? That was a picture. That right there. That's a picture of Lake Superior in March. I swear, we were all in our short sleeves and shorts just the other day. March is just so crazy. It can be anything, right? In fact, we just got a bunch of snow. Pete Smerud and I we were just chatting, and we got maybe uh, 10 to 12 inches of snow on top. So now 31 inches out in my yard. Wow. We've got a nice snow base here. We're going to be skiing probably into June is my guess. Uh, so we've got a good winter here. I, I love it. We're also tapping our sugar maples and they're running already. Well, not today. They stopped for a while. <laughs> but anyway, I want to welcome everybody. This is our 50th speaker series and we get to learn about the Greenwood fire, uh, some of the ecology, some stuff that's been happening around here. I'm really excited about this. Uh, I get to learn about my backyard and I hope that you're excited by it as well. We've got a few experts who are going to be sharing stories and, and I know we're all going to enjoy that. But what we want to do is let everybody in. And I just want to give you a few logistics here is that uh, it's nice to see faces. And so if you uh, want to share your video, then that gives uh, presenters an opportunity to look at nice smiles. Uh, and what we also ask is that you keep yourself muted uh, so that then we don't have feedback and we don't have all kinds of extra stray noises like a dog barking or whatever it might be. <laughs> um, but then finally, uh, I would ask that if you are interested, go ahead and type into the chat uh, who you are, where you're coming from. It's always nice to see a big, long list of people that, that uh, we love and who are part of our Wolfridge community. Um, again, these are pictures from just the month of March, uh, things that have been going on. Ice in the beginning of March on the big lake, going out there skating, got all kinds of birds flying around. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I believe that this big storm that just came in is probably helping some birds migrate faster than they wanted to. So they're probably going to show up here pretty soon. <laughs> we still got a lot of snow. And we're going to be here. Oh, oh, and ravens are lit, sitting on eggs already. Believe it or not, there's seven eggs out there. I, I was just looking at that nest. Um, so anyway, that's probably enough of my blather here. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for helping out to admit everybody. Um, oh, there we go. Now I get to see some faces. Excellent. Welcome here again, everybody. I am excited that you're here. I'm going to pass it over to Pete Smerud who is going to take charge now. Thanks, Joe. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to see many faces and names on that list that uh, I know well. And it's grateful to have you here and to the new folks that may be joining us. Welcome. Uh, I'm the, my name is Peter Smerud. I'm the executive director here at Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center. Welcome to our 50th speaker series. It was uh, the fall of 1971 in Isabella, Minnesota. Uh, ELC, the Environmental Learning Center at the time, first welcomed students to come to Superior National Forest, right in the heart of Superior National Forest, and to learn in the wilds of Superior National Forest. We moved to Finland in 1988, added the name Wolf Ridge, and uh, the rest is 50 years worth of history. And so we're a little over 50 years, but of course, COVID caused a little bit of challenge for us, as one might envision, if you know anything about what we do and that this was a way in which we could reach out to our community of people and engage them and stay connected in a time when we were all doing this virtually. It is now as we've exited co or exiting COVID period that Wolf Ridge has found this is a great way to continue to be connected. And so I'm grateful for everyone joining us here. I'm always asked uh, at events like this to give a little update on what's happening at Wolf Ridge and that I use the term exiting COVID as we are now welcoming schools back again quite regularly. Just today, St. John the Baptist School from New Brighton, Minnesota arrived rolling up the hill amidst the snowstorm and our kids are out on the ropes course, on the lake, on the trails, learning at Wolf Ridge this week. Next week, we'll welcome a couple hundred more. I would say that Wolf Ridge is not back to normal levels yet, but we are operating fully and regularly in the capacity that we know dear. We're trotting around in the woods and on the lakes with kids from all over. And that, uh, that continues here. 
as well as our graduate student program and our student teacher naturalist program. Those folks are here at Wolf Ridge and that program is again fully underway. That I, as I look ahead, the spring season at Wolf Ridge continues at about that level, not quite at full capacity, but pretty darn close. And as we look ahead to summer, our summer registrations for programs are going very well that I anticipate our summer will probably echo the spring. Won't quite be at the levels of pre-COVID, but be very close. And by next fall, I fully expect that we're gonna be rolling again at full strength. And it may warm your heart as it does mine, that once we can fully get past some of those restrictions we're dealing with in society, Wolf Ridge will really start to soar. And I say that based upon the fact that there's no greater statement of value than schools who right now are routinely bringing to us or planning for next year to bring double the kids that they normally bring, to bring the kids that missed out from a year and that they are wanting to bring last year's kids and this year's kids because the act of learning at Wolf Ridge is so important to developing that outdoor ethic that the community holds that they wanna make sure no children miss out on this. And that uh, what we're learning about tonight is something that really holds dear to our hearts because while we embrace fire ecology education in a number of manners at Wolf Ridge in our forest ecology class, we've worked at a fire ecology evening program on and off throughout the years, that the Greenwood fire that we're gonna learn about tonight uh, came rather close in many respects to our, our origination point or our home place being that up at Isabella it was just literally miles away, just a few miles. And yet uh, I'm excited to welcome tonight Lawson and mm -hmm. Ellen Mogardis Shmaniak. I hope I got that right, that uh, I got to meet Ellen and talk with Ellen a great deal as she was hanging out at Wolf Ridge back in late August, September, as Wolf Ridge hosted a great deal of the incident command team. Many, dozens, oh, well over a hundred folks at a time were housed at Wolf Ridge and our facilities were uh, sort of taken over in a very good way by lots of people who kept us, our property safe, and yet now have also enabled ecologically a very interesting new development on the landscape just outside of Wolf Ridge. Later in the in the Zoom event tonight, uh, Meredith St. Pierre, Wolf Ridge's development director is with us. If there are questions that you have during the event for Lawson, for Ellen, for Meredith, for me, for Joe, please put them in the chat. We'll monitor that chat and we will then take the time to respond to everyone that we have time for this evening. So please use that function as we go through the evening. With that, I'm gonna pass it to Lawson. And Lawson has a long history with Wolf Ridge. I am, uh, she and I have been friends for many years and uh, I'm proud to have her here this evening, both for her connections to Wolf Ridge, but also to the forests of Superior National Forest and the ecology therein. Lawson. Thank you, Peter. Very nice. I see a lot of familiar faces and uh, it just warms my heart, warms my heart to see you all. So. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I felt connected to the Wolf Ridge community for over 45 years. Permit me to share just a few highlights. In 1977, at age 23, I joined the growing ranks of student intern naturalists. This was back in the day when the ELC was located in Isabella. In 1986, I worked at the ELC as a school program scheduler. In 2012 and 2013, in need of a top-notch field assistant, I recruited graduate student naturalist Jenna Pollard to assist with surveys in the Boundary Waters as part of my work with the Minnesota Biological Survey. In 2019, I joined the Next Gen tradition, connecting my niece Emma Davis with the Wolf Ridge community as a graduate student naturalist. And in 2020, I joined the Wolf Ridge Farm CSA to support the ELC as they reinvented themselves during COVID. My internship at the ELC, oh, just a second. <laughs> okay. Uh, my internship at the ELC was a cornerstone experience for me. It inspired my curiosity, dedication, and love for the Northern Forest landscape. Since 1978, I've lived in the northern forests of the Upper Great Lakes, working as a forest ecologist, both on the Superior and on the Hiawatha National Forest, and as the northern coordinator for the Minnesota Biological Survey. 
Thus, my understanding of fire as a major driver of ecological processes in fire dependent landscapes is based on my training as an ecologist and my field experience. I fought fires out west, set prairies on fire in northwestern Minnesota, and managed prescribed burns on the Superior. And as I learned more about the historical and cultural aspects of fire, my perspective on fire grew. People influence fire, and fire influences people. So here are a few northern forest fire ecology factoids I've learned. Historically, landscape level fires resulted in a shifting forest mosaic, a near boreal forest of pines, spruce, aspen, birch, and fir in various stages of development. These fires created habitat conditions across the landscape and over time for some of our signature northern forest species, including the back, black back woodpecker, spruce grouse, moose, and even morels, as well as migrant species from further north, such as Canada lynx, and snowy, great gray, and boreal owls. Spring fires favor aspen. Late summer fall fires favor birch. Recent studies found that red maple and oak are increasing after fire. The heat from a 12 foot flame length can scorch foliage up to 80 feet. Fire killed trees fall in the first two years after a fire. The rest over 10 to 50 or more years. Microtopography, such as buried burned logs and exposed mineral soil in the hollows created by the root wads of fallen trees is critical for seedling recruitment and survival. And it is possible for just one 10 foot by 10 foot patch per acre of unburned vegetation to restore the herbaceous layer. Now here are a few northern forest humans and fire factoids. Cultural use of fire by native peoples perpetuated old growth red and white pine forests along the historic border route for necessities such as bir birch bark canoe pitch and blueberries. Big pine logging at the turn of the century resulted in enormous soil sterilizing slash fires across the northern landscape. The era of fire suppression, 1920 to 1970, resulted in vast areas of mixed forest inordinately dense with balsam fir and susceptible to higher levels of spruce budworm and more intense fires across the landscape. Humans' influence on the climate is increasing the frequency and intensity of fires. At 27,000 acres, the Greenwood fire is small as both historic and recent fires go. Just last year, fires burned over a million acres in neighboring Manitoba and Ontario. Humans living in this landscape are both captivated by fire and concerned about the effects of fire on our property, our health and well being, and on the sustainability of the northern forests and wildlife. Over the last 45 years, my husband Lyndon and I have made the northern forest our home. In 2011, and again last year, we found our homestead in the path of large, fast-moving wildfires. During the Pagami Creek Fire in 2011, which made a 16-mile run in a matter of hours, we evacuated our DNR telecommuting office, then we loaded up a trailer with personal belongings, pointed the car out the driveway, and waited it out. The fire came within eight miles. During the early days of the Greenwood Fire, three successive storm systems blew in from the Northwest, bringing them with them very high winds in a classic counterwise, counterclockwise rotation, first sucking in the winds from the Southeast and the South, then switching out of the West and finally the Northwest as the storms approached and broke up, dropping no rain. This pattern created a shifting head to the fire, adding to the difficulty of containment efforts. We evacuated the day the fire jumped County Road 2, blasting through the northwestern fire perimeter. As we evacuated, we were convinced that given one more storm system, the fire would have jumped Highway 1 with not much to stop it and no good choices for northern perimeter protection. 
At the time, we put our chances that we'd see our homestead again intact at about 50-50. The fire came within one and a quarter miles. So the question becomes, how do we live with fire when we live in a fire-dependent landscape? Well, through quick and coordinated emergency response by the Forest Service, DNR, local fire departments, and law enforcement, with the incredible support of family, friends, neighbors, and surrounding communities. Most notably in the case of the Greenwood Fire was Wolf Ridge, who hosted the Instant Command Team, which was led by the Forest Service. Their Facebook broadcasts of fire updates and field operations briefings reassured us with real-time information on fire behavior and firefighting efforts. With programs such as FireWise that demonstrates the role people can play in creating fire adapted and fire resilient communities, providing technical assistance and support for landowner actions, such as balsam fir removal, tree planting, and installing metal roofs. And with eyes wide open, as we work together with foresters, wildlife ecologists, and fire behavior specialists to integrate our understanding of the role of fire in this landscape and of our role, including a realization of the cultural and ecological benefits of fire into our stewardship of the Northern Forest landscape. In closing, I think you can probably guess that after 45 years living in this fire-driven, fire-dependent landscape, I wouldn't choose to live anywhere else. Now I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Ellen Ogardis Shemanyak who has offered to share her insights on the Greenwood Fire as a fire professional and practitioner. Ellen has literally lived with fire her entire 35 year career with the Forest Service with over 23 years of extensive firefighting as well as logistical and planning experience with both, both prescribed burning and wildland firefighting. Ellen has worked as a hotshot and on initial attack crews as engine captain and on helitac teams as a forest fuels analyst, fire logistics coordinator, fire program manager, and as the Superior National Forest fire staff officer for fire fuels, timber, silviculture, wildlife, botany, and air quality programs. In 2017, Ellen accepted the position of Tofty District Ranger. Summing up her fire experience, she told me that everything she has learned about fire has helped her throughout her career in creating order out of chaos, bringing the necessary people together to solve a problem. So from the view on the ridge and the view from here in Isabella, I think we're in good hands. Ellen? Well, thanks Lawson, that was really nice. <laughs> um, Thank you guys for, for joining us tonight on this beautiful March spring day. Most of my family lives south. They just can't believe it's snowing. So um, what we're gonna do today, I thought we'd, we'd get a little geeky here and look at the Greenwood fire on a couple of different levels. Um, what happened and the weather that drives it and the, the, the way the fuels were put together and how that dry, uh, drove the fire. And then um, get a little bit into uh, a fire dependent ecosystem, fire effects, just very, very briefly. And then I'm going to try to leave as much time as we possibly can for questions um, because it, it, it tends to, when we get a little geeky, get um, gives you guys um, some questions to think about. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Here. And you should see, hopefully, maybe Joe, give me a thumbs up. Do you get it? Okay. So basically, I'm um, going to look at um, the Greenwood Fire. And the Greenwood Fire was a fire in Boreal and Great Lakes Pinery Forest. And basically, oh, no, you are not going to do this to me, are you now? Come on. Let's get this to work. Ah, thank you. Um, the slide on the left 
for you guys on a phone, you're going to have to look really close in, <laughs> is just an idea of what, from the, of the air, what a boreal forest looks like. We're on the southern edge of the boreal forest, which is a humongous ecosystem that is in the northern part of the earth. And we're on the most southern edge of it at this point in time. It is a mix of pines, spruce, hardwoods, you know, the birch, aspen, um, understory, balsam everywhere. Um, it's just this dense mix with a lot of wetlands in there. On the right-hand side is the Great Lakes Pinery. And uh, the only pictures I have of them is when they're overrun with balsam fir, which is not a good thing. But um, a Great Lakes Pinery, we're actually on um, obviously the western edge of the Great Lakes and in the northern part of the pinery. Red pine is uh, indicative of Great Lakes Pinery and plus we do have white pine in here. And it is typically more open grown, less canopy closure. And it just tends to have um, not too much understory typically. So large, uh, oh, I want, well anyways, the, the boreal forest, typically a fire that goes through the boreal forest is stand replacing, meaning it burns all the trees, the shrubs and everything. It just burns it all up. It's stand replacing in large. Um, in a Great Lakes Pinery fire, it tends to be on the forest floor. It doesn't get as large and it doesn't tend to burn up almost all the trees. It might uh, burn holes into the trees. You might burn a group of trees here and there, but not the whole stand. So here, large fires are not uncommon. If you look, and I fail to change my cursor, and that's my, I feel so embarrassed, but I only have a tiny white cursor here tonight. But if you see it, 1864 here in the left, and 1864 down here, basically just north of a parent lake, um, on the Tofty district. These green fires were all in uh, 1864. This is based on Bud Heidselman's work. So all the, the core samples he took in there. Um, so 1864 was an important year for lots of fires in this area. 1875, the big purplish stuff and a lot of fires in the area in uh, 1894. So you can see how these fires got very, very large. Typically, these fires, um, they're on the same scale as the Pagami Creek fire, uh, Greenwood fires on the smaller end of it, but typically they would go 50,000 to 250, 300,000 acres. Um, the, these fire seasons did probably didn't start out really, really dry. They might have. We don't you know, have weather data from back there. But um, typically these fires are in, in July, August, and September in this part of the country, and it just gets days since rain. If, if we have five days since rain, it sort of gets crunchy out there. If you've been outside um, 10 days since rain, we're in high fire danger. So it's just the number of days since rain, and then they probably had a nice dry lightning storm come through, put some lightning onto the landscape, or perhaps it was um, indigenous people that had a campfire and walked away with it because they never put out their campfires. Um, and that's a good thing because it just kept stuff clean in there. And some of these fires grew pretty large. Um, so this is where I wanna get geeky because I wanna talk about last summer and I'm, I'm sure all of you guys knew that we were in a drought. And if you weren't from in this area or from this area, we were in a pretty darn good drought. We had come into the spring with very little moisture in the soil. And um, it looked like last spring, it looked like we we're gonna have a great spring, enough moisture, a lot of prescribed burning going on. And then all of a sudden someone pulled the chain and we got 65 degrees and dry. And it just stayed that way. And we were in a drought and it kept getting worse and worse and worse and kept going. And in fact, this fall, we went into the fall, into the winter in a drought, and we still are in a drought. We're abnormally dry along the shore, although we finally got some moisture in the snow. And because um, the snow all winter has been very dry and we're still in abnormally dry up by the border. So we are still in a drought. So what we're, you're seeing right here this is the Canadian Forest Fire 
danger rating system. And um, we don't use the American system here because this works much better for us. And it, uh, the Canadian folks um, have done at least 60 years of research uh, on their fire danger rating system and they really have it dialed in and it works quite well. So I just wanna go through what we are looking at on a, a daily basis during the fire season and approaching fire season. So let's talk about drought code. That's up here. And the drought code is made is uh, made by what the temperature has been and how much rain we have. It's a drought code. And it measures long-term dryness, even over the winter. And um, it's the lower, it's four inches below the surface of the soil down to eight inches below that. So what, eight inch chunk of soil. And it's just measuring the moisture there. And really, when you see numbers of 200 or more in the drought code, we are very, very concerned. That's when we start getting erratic and large fire and persistent fires in the drought code. Another thing we look at that it's related to the drought code, using temperature, relative humidity, and rain up here, I'm sorry, my cursor's not bright colored, is a duff moisture code. And it is, it is um, just from the surface of the um, ground to four inches underneath. So surface to four inches is duff moisture code, and then drought code is four inches down to um, 12 inches, so an eight inch thing. And again, taking temperature, relative humidity, rain for those things. When you put those two together, it gives you an index. And that's the cool thing about um, the Canadian Fire uh, Danger Rating System is they give us fire behavior indexes, indices. And um, the buildup index is one of the main ones that um, I, as a, um, I'm not in fire anymore, but I'm, I'm a manager of fire people, I always key in on. And it's the combination of drought code and deaf moisture code. And it, everything starts at zero. So that's the wettest, 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 wettest. And as it, and they're all open-ended um, scales. I should have said that in the beginning. Anyways, on a buildup index, we typically are in spring, when we're burning in the spring, the buildup index is 10, maybe 12, not very high. Once we start hitting, um, about 50 or 60, we are really, really concerned. And once we go through these things, you'll see when we, I'll bring up the Greenwood fire and you can see where we were with our codes, which was way off the charts for a lot of this stuff. So that's the one side of it. That's the drought code and deaf moisture code, all the stuff that's sort of what I call gushy in the ground and we're, we're measuring it. So on the other side, we have fine fuel moisture code here on the left and it takes, um, Temperature, relative humidity, wind, and rain. Wind being the important part. And it measures the fine fuel moisture code. Fine fuels are the leaves, twigs, grass stems, uh, needles. And these things react very quickly to humidity and to rain. And um, they change day to day. And um, a key number on this one is once we hit 91, and a, oh, I would say it's typically spring when we're burning in May, we're at a fine fuel moisture code of 30. But once we hit 91, um, all H breaks loose. It is fires, uh, everything is available to burn. And um, anytime you get an ignition, stuff moves. So the fine fuel moisture code dives down here to the initial spread index. And the only thing that's added in there is wind and spread might be the key for this, but it co combines the fine fuel moisture code with wind on that given day. And it's a really big influence on uh, fire growth. So a number here that's really key is eight. And we'll see that number here shortly. All righty. And when you combine the initial spread index and the buildup index, it comes up, you know, we all, we're humans and we all want just one number to look at. And we combine it all together to make a fire weather index. And typically numbers over 21 are pretty nasty. So we'll go in here. All right, so here's where I have to have you guys go back to your high school class. It's graphs, this is graphs. So what we're looking at is the, over here, the build up index. This is the weather station at Isabella and it happens to be behind where the dog teams used to be kept um, back in the big open field. 
and um, weather data from 1997 to 2021. And the buildup index, if you recall, is com combining what I call the squishy stuff, the drought code and the duff moisture code, the stuff that's in the ground, and puts it all together. And it tells you how much moisture you have there in that ground. It's an indicator of drought. And in here, we have a couple things. First of all, this gray line that you can barely see, and my cursor is moving here, that's the average line. You'll see it goes up towards August and gets sort of really highest in the first part of uh, end of August, first part of September, and then pulls off really quickly. And that's typically one, we're losing lots of light um, starting around September 1st, and we're usually getting some moisture in here. So that's the average. The maximum is this red. And you can see that it has, still has the same trend as it gets higher and higher towards August, and then it falls off in September. Um, so we have the dates under here. It starts at April 15th, and we're done under October 1st in a one-day period. So I wanted to uh, have you take a look at 2011. That is the year the Bagami Creek fire started. Um, this, oh, and remember, buildup index, remember the number I had in here, 60. 60 is a number of concern here. Here's Pacami Creek fire year in 2011. And this build, in, build up index is doing what it's supposed to do. It gets high and then it gets rich shots of rain and it goes down low and goes up and down and up and down. And down in July, you know, we had a number of fires in the Boundary Waters wilderness that were very small and they put out naturally. Uh, we had some more starts around here from lightning and they were fine. And there, you know, then we had some moisture that came back down and everything was doing fine. And then all of a sudden, the rain stopped. And it certainly, the Pagami Creek fire uh, started, and I'm doing this from the, I wasn't here, someplace right around here is where Pagami started. The big run was right here. All right. So, and then it kept going and moving. And there we go. So that's, that's that buildup index. But take a look at 2021. We went in on a um, in, in a drought. And it takes a, about um, 15 days for this weather station to calibrate itself. We went into a drought and it never stopped being dry. Notice how high that these, we were actually creating records on the middle of June, which is June is our wettest month. We're creating wet records here, got a little bit of moisture, and we're just mirroring the maximum all the way up until we were uh, setting records every single day in July, August, all the way to the middle of August, sort of backed off here, and then kept making records here. So last summer was record breaking for how much drought we have. All right. Um, we spent over 40 days above this 97th percentile, which means 97% of the records, the fire weather records were not as dry as these days. So we spent 40 days and that's, that's tough. That is really tough on us. So again, 60 is a problem. All the fires we had last summer, um, a lot of them were on the Tofte district. Every single fire gave us a problem, even our small abandoned campfires. We had abandoned campfires that went to three or four acres and we, we would find them, oh, maybe at the size of two acres, but because of the wind and because of the fuels are being very receptive, we had a very difficult time putting fires out last summer. Okay, I'm gonna change this up and go a little bit faster here. This is the drought code. Remember that's just the lower, the deeper part of the squishy stuff down under the ground. So at four inches down to 12 inches, note the drought code in 2021. Mirrors, it typically mirrors what happened in 2011 with Pagami Creek. It mirrors it, but it started a lot higher and stayed a lot higher. So we were setting records starting in June with that drought code. So we were not getting moisture whatsoever. So these are the things we look at. And then I'm going to blow you, blow you guys up. I apologize for this. My partner in crime is ill. And um, I was hoping he would clean this up a little bit, but we'll just start going through this. 
here. This is the Greenwood fire. And what we call this is a, a fire progression map here on the left-hand side. If you can see, I hope you can, starting with the green, that's the first day of the fire on August 16th and how much it grew. So on the, the 16th, it started down here and it wormed its way up into this funny shape. It's like a, I don't know, Star Trek chair or something like that. So, and then so subsequently lighter green are the next days and it gets into the yellows and the last days are in the oranges and reds, all right? So we, we just went through real quickly what these little indices are, the fine fuel moisture code, duff moisture code, drought code, initial spread index, buildup index, FWI, fire weather index. And we were saying, and here is the first day of the fire at the bottom, all right? It was 81 degrees, 44% humidity. The winds were six miles an hour, but gusting to 20, all right? And we had no rain. So we said eight, the initial spread in index. If you were hit at eight, you were, had a problem. Well, we were already over eight. Our initial spread index was 8.5. And on the first day, we knew when this fire happened and actually had a <clears throat> three fires about 10 minutes before this one was reported on the Tofty district, um, two of which were in um, the wilderness, not our big wilderness fires, but two other ones in the wilderness. And we were already, again, one of them was a, the abandoned campfire that went to five acres. And, you, and an abandoned campfire in a campsite that hardly has any needles on the ground shouldn't be getting that big very quickly. So we were very, very busy that day. And we also knew that any starts we would have would have a very high potential to get to a large fire and that we probably wouldn't be able to catch it. And that's what happened here. The aircraft that we had on our forest had been running all day long with here in the Greenwood fire and they just could not catch it. And if you can imagine 20 mile an hour wind gusts as you're dropping water on fire, the heat from the fire is coming up and the wind gust is blowing it away. So you, they try to compensate, but it just, there's not much you can do. And the rule of thumb is if you have 15 mile an hour winds, your aircraft isn't, aren't going to be um, effective. Notice that our initial spread index stays above eight, except for just a few times. And every time it's above eight, here's one at 10. And that one we have circled because that is the big run day, all right? The, of course, the uh, drought code and the deaf moisture code, they don't change very quickly, but we were already in extreme fire danger. That's what the bright red is here on the drought code. We were always already up in 500. If you remember 200 was the start of um, the pucker factor, perhaps we could call. <laughs> deaf moisture codes are already up in there and the buildup index and anything again on that buildup index, once you hit about 80, you're, there's not much you can do. The Canadians, if you know, uh, and I think uh, Lawson talked about the million acres they burned that were, was burned last summer, their um, philosophy is move the people out of the way and let the fire do its thing. That's what they do. Because of the boreal forest they're in, they, that's how they live with fire. Um, we, on the other hand, have a, a different philosophy, which is protect everything, you know, all the the values at risk that we can. Of course, values at risk are also human lives. So we do a lot of things that protect, protect human lives, but um, you know, the Canadians do a little bit differently. Okay, so first day, uh, August 16th, initial attack, we knew we were gonna have a problem. The next dates between the 17th and the 22nd had some sustained growth. Um, and that's all the green in here, had some sustained growth going in here. Um, there are a lot of uh, grassy areas, a lot of um, um, thicker, lots of balsam fir in here. And um, the winds would gust, but they weren't you know, consistently over 20 miles an hour. But what hit in here and what really drove this is the spruce budworm infestation. It is just full, if you guys live down there at Isabella, it's full of dead and dying trees. And in, indeed this, if you could just sort of make a little U shape starting up here in the Northwest and around and back up, everything above that U shape has spruce, spruce budworm kill in there. 
On the 23rd of August, it was a dry cold front, front coming from the Northwest. The winds as Lawson said, start in the East and they clock their way around to the South, Southwest and then back up to the Northwest. And they usually get um, more and more heavy or uh, higher winds as the day goes on. Um, the fire made a six mile fire run. And this is on again on the 23rd and this is the or, uh, yellowy and orange here and ran right to Highway 1 and overtook Highway 2 at that point in time. Um, and it did rain very, very late in the day, but it was very misty and hardly, it was just a trace of rain. But that was a typical, you know, summer fire, uh, summer fire season storm that we had. And after, after a couple of days, um, the fire basically uh, received about two inches of rain around the 29th of August. And by then we were getting really short days. Uh, I think we lose about three minutes a day starting in the, that you know start part of September. So we were, uh, the fire growth was limited and it, that's the final fire footprint that we have. So fire effects, what are we likely to see this spring out there? These uh, photographs are from the Ham Lake fire. And um, so what you see are a lot of forbs, shrubs coming up in a little grassy green here. And in fact, last uh, fall, um, probably I would say the first part of November, first or second day of November, I was there and there was a lot of fireweed and fern up already in, um, that area. So that it's typically what you're going to see in here. You're going to see uh, burned out trees, blackened trees, snags maybe, some of them on the ground, but you're still going to have uh, birch and aspen establishing. You're going to have um, other forbs in there. So that's what it should be looking like. And then usually about four years later, again, this is Ham Lake Fire. Um, but about four years later, you see, and this was taken in the fall, so this is tough. This is a bunch of blueberries in here. This is my favorite blueberry patch that's no longer um, producing because it has, hasn't had fire now. So it's over by Flower Lake, just so you know. Um, and we have all these uh, jack pine coming up. And these jack pine are about four feet tall because they do about a, a foot a year. Um, we have still that's hardened snags up here. Um, and we have birch, aspen, blueberry stump sprouting. We have as much sprouts in here. You can see all the little forbs in here, lots of grasses, ferns, and that's what it should look like in the fall after four years. And now this is uh, eight years after uh, Ham Lake. And what you see are um, birch in here. As Al competed the aspen, we have jack pine. That is just all those trees that look dead. This is the fall, <laughs> all the leaves are out. Um, that's mostly birch and some aspen in there. Uh, lots of blueberries. This is a big blueberry patch down here. And um, again, a lot of forbs in uh, where the drier sites are is where all the jack pine are. So the jack pine have now selected themselves to be up here on the ridge tops where it's drier. And then the birch have out competed the jack pine down low. All right. And we all, here's where I wanted to start the living in a fire dependent ecosystem. I know um, as humans, you know, we have a very short um, time span with our brain of, of, you know, how we see the world. And when a fire comes through, I, um, I've been hearing this all my career and I've never quite figure out why, why is it the media that says it or is it, we, we say what the media says, I don't know. But fire, you know, can destroy things, but it doesn't use, it doesn't destroy the ecosystem. It just changes the ecosystem. And so after a fire, um, you know, aspen, birch, red maple, um, and all these shrubberies in here, you know, come back up with new growth and it um, attracts these small little things that I try not to hit with my Prius when I drive across Forest Highway 11. Um, you know, it attracts moose. And the, the cool thing about moose um, in this part of the, the world, you know, we've, they're struggling. And, 
and uh, you know they get the brainworm, etc. But after the Cavity Lake fire, Alpine Lake fire, and Ham Lake fire, we had a huge uptick in moose population, and that's happening also on the Pagami Creek fire. And our, um, our friends on the Fond du Lac Reservation and Grand Portage are um, like uh, just maybe six weeks ago, collared a total of ten moose in the Greenwood fire area. That is like super cool because Isabella used to be the place of, you know, people always goes, where can we see the moose? And you go, just drive up highway one, you'll find a moose. And um, fun fact, the fire team that I was on that I brought here back in 2004 or five, they got sick and tired of seeing the moose because they were in the way because they needed to go do work. So they were tired of highway one in the moose, but you know, you've seen the moose population if you live up here and really they sort of disappear. Well, I think it's pretty cool that 10 moose were collared um, on the Greenwood fire this winter. That's pretty cool. So there's our moose thing. And then of course, my favorite parts, I'm, I'm such a bird watcher, but watching some of these species that we typically don't see um, come in after a fire to you know, take care of insects is another thing. So there's you know just examples of many things that happen that may be not as bad as, as some people think when a fire comes through. All right, um, you know, I think the biggest thing for us living up here in the northern part of Minnesota is that fire is that natural process. We have to have that fire um, as a chemical process to keep our healthy ecosystems moving forward. We can mimic fire pretty well with timber sales or mulching or, you know, uh, shearing. But it's not the same because the fire is a chemical process that really does a lot of work um, in the soil, on the surface, and um, is required, their heat's required for the jack pine to open up their cones. Um, it's just something that this, um, because we live in a fire dependent ecosystem, we've got to have fire. So our lifespan is very short compared to the trees. So I always try to have people swap it around and go, yeah, my favorite place has burned. And it's sad. And it, you know, people are really, you know, very emotional and very attached. And I, I feel <laughs> for folks, you know, things have been quote destroyed. But if we were young enough, we would see it come back. And we're hoping, you know, that we can get people to start thinking about, all right, what I see is a change. It's not, it's not gone, it's not destroyed, it's changed. And the ecosystem will restore itself if we allow it to have the right fire or it has the right fire at the right time. So Greenwood fire started when it should have started because it got started by lightning and it took off on one of these drought drought driven years. And um, I'm very hoping we won't have another large fire on our forest because that's, that's a lot of work. But um, if we do, we will do our best to um, keep it as small and herd it where we can keep it away from people but especially out in the boundary waters, we are prepared to go ahead and do what we did last year is, you know, let keep making sure people are safe, pulling people out of the way, moving visitors, perhaps closing bits of the, the boundary waters so that we can have fire in there. Um, and let's just see what, you know, fire will bring for our ecosystem. So that is what I have on the ecosystem. And then I wanna really quick talk about FireWise. Um, I probably, half my phone calls since the Greenwood fire has been, well, what do I do? You know, how, how do I, I don't want fire to come to take my, my home. And I don't want fire come to take your home either. And FireWise is a program that uh, you can go to Lake County, um, on their website to emergency management and um, get their FireWise program there. Um, Matt Pullman is our emergency management specialist in Lake County. Um, Cook County has one. St. Louis County has one. I'm thinking, I know Kuchiching County has a FireWise program as well, or maybe it's married up with St. Louis County, but we actually in the Arrowhead of Minnesota are really lucky. We have some really robust um, plans and programs. So I really invite you to do FireWise. And FireWise is pretty straightforward. We have to, as humans, we have to be thoughtful about fire and we actually have to be active. And FireWise is 
big things like making sure when you're you need to replace your roof, replace it with a metal roof instead of a asphalt's fine, metal's better. Um, vegetation around your house. I love to live in the middle of the woods and I love to look out, literally look out a window and have a tree there and see the birds going up and down the tree. But I also know after years and years and years of trying to do structure protection, I don't want any fire at my house. So I done firewise and there's um, depending on where, how your house is situated and what kind of vegetation is in about um, landscaping your um, lawn and it can be very, or your uh, yard and it can be very natural. You don't have to like plant any, anything. You can just thin things out and make sure there's places where, um, you know, the canopy is open so fire can't leap from tree to tree. So anyways, FireWise is a really great program. In this link where you go to the uh, Lake County website, they also have a link to the FireWise USA that um, invites neighborhoods. And a neighborhood could be three houses. That's a neighborhood. Um, it could be hundreds of houses. It invites a neighborhood to become FireWise and you are, you're eligible for grants and assistance and all that fun stuff. So. That's just something to, to hang on to. And again, that Lake, Lake County, Minnesota um, government website, when you go to emergency services, is really helpful. And I think that's all I have here. Yes, that's all I've got. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully we have some questions. Thank you, Ellen. Again, this is Peter. And uh, I know there's at least already one question in here, Ellen. <laughs> no. hey. And uh, but first of all, thank you so much. Uh, and I know friends and neighbors who have used and have uh, benefited greatly from Firewise. So I can't emphasize enough, along with Ellen, to look into that and see what you can do at your home and or advocate for your neighbors around you to do the same is we're kind of all in this together. That uh, So I'm going to start off here first, Ellen. There was a question from Ben Wolf, and I happen to know that they have some property up in that area asking about the plans for the piles of forest debris that were piled up along Highway 1, along Highway 2, any of us have driven up there, we've seen them all. What the plan, what the purpose is for those piles and the plans for those piles that are in those areas along the highway. All right, so those piles were created last uh, summer for a shaded fuel break. And because it was a fire, emer a fire emergency, they, the loggers went in and just did a shaded fuel break along Highway 1, regardless if it was private property or not private property. So um, then, what we need to do is, first of all, the forest, the stuff that's on Forest Service property, we will burn it next fall. Um, it's too, it was too green to burn. And the stuff that's on private property, I am trying to find out from our timber folks how we can offer, um, not we, the Forest Service, but how private landowners can um, get loggers out there to help either take the pile apart and you can use what's in there as firewood or burn it or whatever. And we're in that process of getting those permissions. If you can imagine, it's been since 2011 that we've had a large fire and none of, very few people on this forest were here during the Bagami fire. Um, I actually was working out of Grand Rapids, but nationally, so I wasn't a part of it. So a lot of people don't have the corporate knowledge of what do we do afterwards. So that's what we're working through and it's taking a very long time. Hopefully um, I will have available to landowners in the next, I'm hoping four to six weeks, um, information packet, just one or two pages of what's happening, what's the Forest Service gonna do, what you can do as a private landowner. You know, do you need to get trees, uh, uh, Lake County, Soil and Water Conservation Service, I hope I got that name right, um, has trees and, and I'm trying to gather all that stuff up so it'll be available. We'll put it out on social media and it'll be available to everyone. So that's a roundabout way of, I don't know what's gonna happen uh, for most of those big piles, but we're working on it. Nice. And I know Derek or others from Lake County Soil and Water Conservation District are on the Zoom. If you want to put anything oh, in that, Derek, go for it. <laughs> Did I do it right? Yeah. Uh, 
Ellen, another question from Lauren Cottrell, who's a former Wolf Ridge naturalist, and I know working elsewhere as a naturalist now, that wondering more about the Canadian wildfire policies. And you mentioned that they're more willing to let things burn naturally. Mm -hmm. if, humans, if humans have been evacuated from a fire zone, is there less concern about protecting buildings from burning? And any difference in the way they're depicting or teaching fire that impacts their firefighting policies? Ooh, that's some really good questions. Um, first of all, um, I don't know, have a, anyone ever been up to Sioux Lookout or Ignace or up there? So basically, um, building in uh, the Ontario province, you have to build firewise. You have to. There's no question about it. There's, there's zoning laws, et cetera. So the buildings are a little more hardened, a um, lot less. The people that have their old homestead um, log cabins, they have to at least put a, a metal roof on there. So, um, and then clearing out around the, the houses and then of course, spring cleaning, getting the, the needles and stuff off roofs and underneath the eaves, et cetera. Um, what they do typically is set up sprinkler systems. And um, how do I put this? Um, I grew up in an agricultural area. We didn't use a lot of water because it was central Ohio. We got plenty of water. When I first went on a Canadian fire, I'm not lying to you, they use five inch hard pipe from the lake through this intensively huge pump. I mean, we think our, our Mark III fire pumps are really cool, right? Oh, they, they are nothing compared to <laughs> what these pumps that they use. They're propane powered and they have these sprinkler systems that can go a mile either way. And so they set up all these sprinkler systems. They're, you know, they're moving people out. They tend to move people to Thunder Bay. Um, and they do this a lot, you know, just um, pile them up in aircraft and, and move them uh, to Thunder Bay. And um, then they utilize their water scooping aircraft. They utilize the sprinkler system and they, you know, that's, they put a lot of effort in there, but at least the people are out of the way. And so then you can decide whether or not to put firefighters in. And that's the other thing, because remember values at risk um, a lot of people think values at risk are, are houses and schools, you know, all the structures, but our value at risk first is and foremost is a human. So whether it's the firefighter or the person who lives in that building or a visitor, that's the value at risk. So that's where we're thinking at all times during fires is, you know, that, that uh, phrase, is the juice worth the squeeze? I mean, is it putting somebody in front of there worth it in case they get burned? I mean, it's not worth it. I'm, I'm sorry, your, my house is not worth the life of you, Joe, <laughs> Pete or Joe, it's not. And so that's constantly what I'm doing as a, a manager is making sure that our firefighters who are very professional, man, the DNR, Forest Service folks, the Fish and Wild, that we in Minnesota, we have some top-notch people that when you go out West, instead of, there are some states I can say when, because I worked out West for 20 years, um, you say you're from such and such a state and you just sort of roll your eyes and go, okay, but we get Minnesotans. It's like, ah, you guys can handle water. You know how to use aircraft. This is great. You're professional. So we're really lucky with that. Our, and the Canadian counterparts, they have helped us so much when we had the large blowdown in 1999, um, of 500,000 acres of trees that blew down and how to deal with those. We are constantly talking with our Canadian partners because you know, they've got a lot more experience in the boreal forest and they are people we go to. And then the second part of the question was the- uh, The difference in the way they're depicting or teaching fire about fire that impacts their firefighting philosophy. Well, the teaching about fire is that, you know, basically fire's part of the ecosystem and you live in a fire dependent um, place. So you expect wildfires and don't start them. Ellen, and one more question from Rodney and Julie that I can set up well here is I remember being in incident command and the fire was taking a run to the northwest. It had jumped Highway 2. There was arguably, I, I had friends and neighbors had some panic as it was taking this run towards Slate Lake, Stony River, mm -hmm. Chubb Lake area where there's lots of homes and then it just stopped. And I know it stopped because a few years prior, Spear National Forest had done some intense, some, some prescribed burns in there. Mm -hmm. The question is, I'm wondering if there are any plans to involve intentional burning activity to reduce the size of fire, but also that may improve the ecosystem. 
Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Working on that today. Um, we we have a lot of prescribed fire. Some people call it intentional burning um, set for the next uh, five to ten years, and they've been. Um, I would say, I can. The ones I was working on today was for the Quishway District over by Burnside Lake. But um, where we're trying to go, uh, let's let's try to give you the over the 30,000 point view instead of a five foot view. Um, we're looking for the places that we have our hazardous fuels, fuels that give us a problem. And that is dead and dying um, stuff that usually is spruce budworm um, relative to that. So we have a lot of that around the Isabella area. We know that. We also have, where's the concentration of the humans, the, the structures? Um, where's the places that it's hard to get to and hard to get out of? Well, that really is Isabella right now. Um, there are places on the Gunflint Trail that fit that, um, uh, the criteria. Uh, some places around, um, is it Wilson Lake in here in Tofty? And then as you go over to um, Quishway, um, Birdside Lake is the Quishway LaCroix, uh, LaCroix district boundary. Um, that is a really tough place to be. And then anyways, up Highway 1 starting around um, past Isabella, that whole place has a lot of um, budworm going on in there. So we do have a lot of um, vegetation management we want to do in there. And a lot of times if fire hasn't been um, in the one you're talking about, um, uh, can't remember the name of the pitcher pines in there. Um, what they did in there went and thinned out trees and then they did a prescribed burn underneath the next year. And we do a lot of that in uh, Northern Minnesota because we haven't had a lot of fire in the last hundred years. It just really hasn't had a lot of large fire that we can just then continue burning. Uh, we had a lot of large fires in the boundary waters, but not too many that um, have come out. So um, yeah, we have on the Tofty district, we have a thousand acre one that we want to do hopefully this um, fall that is right along the edge of the boundary waters over by Sawbill. We have another around thousand acre one that's over by Dumbbell Lake. I think it's 800 or a thousand acres. And again, these are in conjunction with some of the um, timber sales we've done, some of the uh, shearing for um, in the winter that we share for moose. And then once we share for moose and the next fall we burn it again and the, the shrubs just take off and, and the moose are happy. So yes, we're, we continue to do that and we always, ask your in, um, help because again, people see fire as something that is destroying and we're trying, and you can see the evidence there at Pitch of Pines of where fire will, can come into these areas that we have thinned out and burned underneath and the fire will be ripping through and then stop. It'll just drop to the ground. There'll still be some fire in there, but that's a place where firefighters can safely stand and fight the fire. So we do that a lot and all the burning that we're doing is burning that is either gonna help wildlife, and that's the first part, or it's there to reduce hazardous fuels. So that's all we're concentrating now um, on this forest. Nice. Ellen, I think we're just about at time. I could actually listen to some of this for quite a while. I'm really grateful. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm grateful to everyone. It's fun because I know people on this Zoom call that this is very personal to that they have property or live in those areas, such as Lawson and Lynn that uh, we know. So I'm grateful to the folks that are locals right here and those that are just intrigued by how this is a change, as we know from Ellen, that we just simply have to live with. Things have just changed and it will take a period of time and cycles will repeat themselves. I'm really grateful to everyone here this evening, to Lawson for hosting us. Ellen, thank you so much for the time with us this evening. I see some hands clapping out there. I think a number of people have really enjoyed it. Uh, I wanna thank Meredith St. Pierre, Wolfridge's Development Director, who is helping coordinate this. We have a couple of Wolfridge board members, Shell Smith and Andy Datko are joining us this evening. Thank you to those folks as well. And one last one that I'm going to put out there is that uh, thank you to Galen Harms and Scott Gils Gislison, who through their companies Fortune Financial and North Star Resource Group are sponsoring with financial support this entire speaker series. 
I think everyone probably knows that the students pay to come to Wolf Ridge. There's a tuition and yet we work really hard to keep it affordable to all kids. For example, it's $249 for an entire week at Wolf Ridge for a student in school. And that uh, if you can infer from that, that doesn't cover all the costs. We really do rely on your support that if you can, please consider a, a gift to support Wolf Ridge. Meredith just posted in the chat the link that you can go to. I know many of you on this call already do that level of support. And to you, thank you so much. We couldn't do what we do without all of you joining us together. Joe's comments, Lawson's comments early on about the Wolf Ridge community is oh so true. It takes a village, as they say, and uh, that Ellen and Lawson and Joe and Meredith and Shell and Andy, all from Wolf Ridge, thank all of you for joining us this evening. And if it's not a donation, consider spreading the word. Wolf Ridge is still looking for camp counselors. If you know of somebody who is a uh, early, just graduated high school or is a freshman college, perhaps a granddaughter, grandson, you can uh, tell them to contact us and we're looking for people to work this summer with us. We will be, we're looking for next year's naturalists. We have some permanent positions open. And so spread the word about both our programs and opportunities to engage with Wolf Ridge and on many different levels. And we would welcome everyone to join us up here in the work that we're doing. Again, thank you to Ellen. Thank you to Lawson. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>